Welcome to the March 24th worship service at Peace Lutheran Church. Peace Lutheran Church is located in St. Louis, Missouri at 737. Welcome to the March 24th worship service at Peace Lutheran Church. 
Peace Lutheran Church is located in St. Louis, Missouri at 737 Barracks View Road, near the intersection of Interstate 255 and Telegraph Road. The theme of our worship service on this Palm Sunday is, Who is This? Pastor John Ferguson will deliver the sermon based on the text from Matthew chapter 21, verses 1 to 11. Our liturgist today is Pastor Robert Brown. The organist is Kendra Rusler. The order of service can be found on our website at peacelutheranstl.org by clicking on the Resources tab and then the Audio and Bulletins menu option. The radio broadcast of today's worship service is sponsored by Nancy Fisher, in loving memory of her brother, Ken Trumper. The opening hymn is All Glory, Laud, and Honor, hymn number 442 in Lutheran Service Book, 102 in Lutheran Worship, and 160 in the Lutheran Hymnal. Good morning. Thank you for joining us this morning on this Palm Sunday morning as we kick off Holy Week. Just a few brief announcements uh, before we get started. Uh, speaking of Holy Week, uh, on the back of your bulletin, uh, if you haven't seen it already, is the Holy Week schedule. Uh, so I encourage you to take it home, uh, put it on your fridge or somewhere where you will uh, see it for the week, uh, and just uh, keep track of what is coming up in terms of services uh, this upcoming week. Also, in addition to uh, Easter being next Sunday, uh, we are having our Easter breakfast as well uh, from 7.30 a.m. to 10 a.m., uh, and that will be in the gym. So I encourage you to either come early or stay after uh, whatever service you go to uh, and join us uh, for that Easter breakfast. And then lastly, uh, coming up in a few weeks, uh, on April 13th, um, we will be participating in the Missouri District Shine event. Uh, it is a servant event where we volunteer and we go out into the community to uh, help serve our neighbor and to help make our community better. Uh, and there is a sign-up sheet uh, that is online, uh, so you can either sign up going to the link that is in the announcement in your bulletin, uh, or there is a QR code uh, on the Commons counter. That is it for our announcements this day. We rise to receive our Lord's gifts.
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. Today is the beginning of Holy Week. We recall how our Savior gave his life so that our sins may all be forgiven, and heaven is open to us. Even during worship, our minds wander to other concerns. We turn our hearts and minds to focus on our Lord's step-by-step determination to free us from every sin, confident of the forgiveness he won through his glorious death and resurrection. Let us then admit our sinful condition to him and to one another. I confess to you, my brothers and sisters, that I have sinned in my thinking, speaking, and acting. I am mired in sin and incapable of saving myself. Heavenly Father, for Jesus' sake, and because of his sacrifice for us fallen creatures, we beg you to forgive, strengthen, and turn us to your will, so that we may follow our Savior in loving service to you and to one another. As a call and ordained servant of Christ, who gave himself over to death, that we might have eternal life, and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Merciful Father, you sent your Son to take upon himself our flesh and to suffer death upon the cross. Grant that we may follow the example of his humility and patience and be made partakers of his resurrection. 
We pray this in Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord who lives and who reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. Our Old Testament reading for Palm Sunday is from Zechariah, chapter 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim, and the war horse from Jerusalem, and the battle bow shall be cut off, and he shall speak peace to the nations. His rule shall be from sea to sea, and from the river to the ends of the earth. As for you also, because of the blood of my covenant with you, I will set your prisoners free from the waterless pit. Return to your stronghold, O prisoners of hope. Today I declare that I will restore to you double. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our epistle lesson is from Philippians chapter 2. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We rise for the gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 21st chapter. Now when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethphage, to the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, and on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put on them their cloaks, and he sat on them. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the Son of David! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest! And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up, saying, Who is this? And the crowds said, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. This is the gospel of the Lord. We confess together the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated, and at this time we invite the children forward for a brief children's message. Stephanie Torbeck will now present the children's message.
guys today? Oh, today is a big day. Do you know what's special about today? It's Palm Sunday. It's the beginning of Holy Week. Now, on this lovely day, sorry, <laughs> um, we have something big that happened. What was the big thing that happened? Yeah. And can you imagine how exciting that would have been? Here you hear Jesus is coming to town, and the people came out, and they heard he was coming, and came around, and they were shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Can you imagine seeing Jesus right in on, on um, Palm Sunday? That would have been pretty cool, right? But something else happened. He, how did he ride into Jerusalem? On a, donkey. on a donkey, yeah. And do you think, like, if you went into Jerusalem or if I went into Jerusalem, do you think that they would shout Hosanna and wait for me and be there? No. Why did they do this for Jesus? What was different? Exactly. So here's the thing. Some of the people had it right. They knew he was the Savior. He knew he was the Messiah. But others were a little confused. They thought that he was going to be an earthly king. And is that why Jesus came to Jerusalem, to be an earthly king? No, he's our heavenly king. And so he never came to be an earthly king. So some of the people were a little confused, and that's where we're going to see some of these things happening in this next week. We know that the end of this week, Jesus is going to die on the cross to save us, right? So that one day we will get to go to heaven. But is that the end of the story? No. What happens three days later? Yeah. He rises, so this is a big week. It's an exciting week. Well, I was wondering if you could help me. I have some palm branches. They're pretend ones. And if you, if you would help me wave them and shout Hosanna, do you think you can help me with that? All right, great. Here's one for you. All right. Perfect. Ready? We're going to hold them up and, sh and say, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Can you help me with that? All right, ready? Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Maybe we can get everybody to help us, do you think? Ready? Okay, ready? Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. All right. Well, after church, if you want, I have some of these books about Holy Week. And if you want, you can get one after church today. I'll be in the back. Thanks for coming up today. You can take these. We will now sing our hymn of the day, Ride On, Ride On in Majesty, hymn number 441 in Lutheran Service Book, 105 in Lutheran Worship, or 162 in the Lutheran Hymnal.
grace and mercy to you in Jesus Christ. We have meditated over our Lenten season on the Passion according to St. John, looking at Jesus' trial, looking at his suffering leading to his death. And as we come into this Holy Week, though, we kind of reverse course. And now we move to more of a real-time contemplation of those events. One week for one week. As Jesus goes into Jerusalem with his followers on Sunday, so we today then remember that moment. As we go along this week at Hope, we might read about his teaching in the temple and how quickly the friction grows between him and the Pharisees and the Jewish leaders. We will contemplate Jesus' giving of the new covenant in his body and blood on Monday Thursday. We will think about and ponder his death for us on Friday. And then we somberly but expectantly wait for the weekend remembrance of his resurrection from the dead. Holy Week in the church It sets a stark contrast to the world this week. The world in general doesn't really blink an eye at what the church is doing over the course of these seven days. Most of us will still have to work this week. Most of us still have to go to school. The days keep moving. The world keeps turning. And at the store, Easter is about kitsch and eggs and marshmallows and rabbits. Really more about springtime and less about the Messiah overcoming death. In other words, the world will pretty much just shrug its shoulders across this week and next weekend, as it does every year. And the reason for that is, in part, behind the question that the folks have in Jerusalem when Jesus comes into it in our text. They're giving, his followers are giving him a little bit of pomp and circumstance, at least enough that it causes a number of the people in the city to ask, who is this? And that question is the question when it comes to every age of the earth, when it comes to every generation, including ours. Who is this? The followers in our text answer by saying, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. And it's true that Jesus was a prophet. He was able to predict many things that came true. He was able to speak about the truths of God with authority. He verified what he said with the miracles that he performed. And there are groups still today that say that he was a prophet. There are some factions of Judaism that consider that a possibility. The Muslims argue that Jesus is the second greatest prophet compared to Muhammad. But is that comprising everything that Jesus is. Along the same lines, there are persons who say that Jesus is a wise man, a good man, a guru for our lives to help us understand how to improve ourselves, to give us guidance, who just accidentally got caught up in the machinations of the politics of the day and was destroyed by them. But, you know, he's the symbol of what we can all aspire to for social justice and freedom from oppression. Jesus was a teacher. Well, that's true to some extent, right? Jesus cared about the poor, cared about the abuse of the widow and the orphan. Jesus was known as a teacher. But does that sum up who Jesus is? Today, Jesus is often depicted as our brother, as our friend, as an all-around nice guy, as kind of a matronly figure with mother-like care for us. Jesus does care about you. But does that sum up who Jesus is? Many of these ways of looking at Jesus are interesting. Some of them are even appealing. But the problem with this list, and we could make even a bigger one about Jesus, is that none of them fully encapsulate who Jesus is and who he says he is as given to us in the scriptures. So then, who is this Jesus? In our text, Matthew gives us one other title just within 
the framework of the verses we have. He cites the prophet Zechariah, who calls him king. But does Jesus really look like a king? Jesus has no army with him. He has no splendid banners or uh, uh, splendid armor. He has no trumpets heralding his approach. He has no war horse. He doesn't have a coterie with him. He does not have any fine silks and royal colors. Instead, he's just in peasant garb. He rides a borrowed donkey. He has women and children singing praises, not about his victories and battle, but singing praises to God. If he's a king, he does not look particularly majestic or imposing or really kingly. And as we look ahead, as the Passion Week unfolds, Jesus is tossed about in mockery by the masses. He is thrown from trial to trial by the leaders. The charges brought against him are that he claimed to be God and that he was a king or claimed to be king, so blasphemy and insurrection. This is why Pilate puts the inscription over him, that this is Jesus, king of the Jews, while he is just unceremoniously thrown away on the cross with the rest of the rabble. Still not really what we would picture as a king. He kind of sounds weak and cowardly, even kind of motherly. But is that really what's going on? We find in Scripture that he is called a prophet and preacher and teacher. The Pharisees call him a devil and rebel and insurrectionist. The devils themselves call him the Holy One of God and ask him if he has come to torment them before the time. He speaks with authority. He calls out demons with a word. He heals the maimed. He raises the dead. As soon as Peter confesses him as Christ, Jesus then begins to tell them more about his full path. In Matthew 16, he says, uh, Matthew tells us, from that time Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem. And he tells us why. It's not to bring reform. It's not to make peace. It's not to go on holiday. It's not even just to observe the Passover. Instead, Jesus tells them he goes to Jerusalem to suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and to be killed and on the third day be raised. And if we begin to think that maybe he's just prophesying something he has no control over, we hear his words in John chapter 10 where he says, I have the authority to lay down my life and the authority to take it up again. And later in Matthew chapter 26 in the Garden of Gethsemane, when Peter has his sword out, Jesus stops him and says, Do you think I cannot appeal to my Father? And he will at once send more than 12 legions of angels. But then how should Scripture be fulfilled? Or again, in the Gospel of John, standing before Pilate, who has the power to kill or to allow to live, Jesus, though he is whipped and battered, mocked and bloody, he stands before him and simply says, you would have no authority over me at all unless it was given you from above. And there in that trial, he takes ownership of the title Zechariah gives him. And says to Pilate, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. And yet for all of that, on the cross, rather than revile those mocking him, Jesus forgives them. And we're told when all things were completed and all of his work was at an end, Jesus then gives up his spirit voluntarily for you. Jesus is king, but his glory there is veiled. And it's veiled because he has not come to replace Herod. He has not come to wrest the Jewish people from the grip of Rome. These would only be treating the symptoms of the disease. Instead, Jesus has come forth to go to war with something much bigger, much grander, much more glorious than anything a king on earth ever conceived of, despite the drive of ambition and power among men. Jesus goes to conquer all sin, to conquer death, to conquer the prince of this world, 
for all time for you and me. Jesus does not go to torture because he is helpless. He has the armies of heaven at his call and the power to command them. What discipline he must have had. What perfect goodness and mercy that instead of destroying those who hurt him and mocked him, he gives them forgiveness. That he who made all things, that even knit the skin together of these very persons, allows them to tear his own away. He has mercy on them, not because he is helpless or cowardly or inadequate, but because he sees that all men, every person including you and me, are damned in our sins for an eternity in hell unless he intervenes. So God comes forth from his throne in heaven, deigns to become a creature like us, and he battles on our behalf all the forces allayed against us. As Zechariah rightly prophesies, our king comes to us to confess Jesus as less than God-man, as less than Savior, is to deny who he is, to deny what it means that God is king and that Jesus is that king. You and I instinctually, in our sinful natures, want to deny that Jesus is these things because it makes us uncomfortable, because he forces us to see ourselves as we really are that we are sinners unable to save ourselves from our sins, unable to get out from under the machinations of the world and the devil, unable to wrest ourselves from the grip of death. He forces us to have humility, to see our own inadequacy. And for those who do not want to see, who want to turn away, who want to just make him merely human, they want to shrug their shoulders to set themselves in indifference to try to pass by the cross unheeding. But they do so to their peril and their destruction. Once we are made to see, we find we have no recourse but to open our hands to God with nothing in them and merely wait for our King, our God, our Savior, to come to us to save us. And he does. And that's what Holy Week is about. Having conquered sin, death, and the devil, having covered our sins before God's wrath and judgment by his atoning blood, he does not then leave us to work the rest of it out for ourselves. For we cannot come to Christ on our own. Luther says of this Palm Sunday passage, there is no other beginning than this, that your king comes to you. And he does so the way that he promised he would. Then in ruling all things, he sends his spirit into our hearts and minds and lives through his word, through the waters of our baptism, through the bread and wine become his body and blood, through the preaching, through the reading of his word, calling you keeping you in this faith. The world shrugs its shoulders in the darkness of its ignorance concerning Jesus. To the world, he can be anything other than what he really is. God, King, Savior, the very one the world so desperately needs and yet so desperately wants to reject as it was in Jerusalem during Holy Week. That is still how it is today. So as you and I enter this Holy Week, as we go about our lives this week, day by day, we're invited by Jesus and by those who are following him on that Palm Sunday to also cheer him on, even though we know full well to where he goes. May this week in your heart, the song that we just sung, be kept there. Right on in majesty and lowly pomp, right on to die. Bow your meek head to mortal pain, and then take, O oh God, your power and reign. May God reign in your hearts and minds this week and beyond this week. 
as we live out the answer to that question, who is this? It's Jesus of Nazareth, prophet, teacher, king, God, and Savior for you. Amen. Burnell Hackman will now direct the chancel choir in performing Sing This Beautiful Morning. Father in heaven, we shout Hosanna in our hearts at the arrival of your Son into our hearts and lives by the gift of faith in him. Preserve your spirit in the lives of your people, and by that spirit continue to encourage us to pray. We pray now for those ill or recovering, especially Thomas Banks, Sherry Beerwagon, Maureen Bryan, Bonnie Brooks, Jennifer Christ, Barbara Eichhorst, Daryl Gregory, Kristen Hammond, Lee Irwin, Paula Justice, Dolores Kleinsorg, Jane Kleinsorg, Karen Cruzy, Richard Meyer, Cole Maholi, Lisa Murphy, Kendra Nagashima, Louise Oster, Roy Rainey Jr., Janet Reppert, Lori Schmidt, Roger Seabee, Barbara Sneed, Janet Thompson, Joanne Thompson, Virginia Viviano, Evelyn Ulig, Ray Wagner, Scott Winkler, and Pam Fassler. Have mercy on them and their caretakers, according to your gracious will. Lord, we pray your blessing on our confirmands who are to be confirmed later today. Help their parents continue to partner with them as they grow to become men and women after your own heart. This Holy Week, 
Move hearts to focus on Jesus rather than the world. Bring peace to all nations. Bring an end to abortion. Keep our soldiers and emergency, emergency personnel safe. All these petitions we bring before you, Father, further praying as your Son taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give to you his peace. For the closing hymn, we will sing Lift High the Cross, hymn number 837 in Lutheran service book and 311 in Lutheran worship. The radio broadcast of today's worship service is sponsored by Nancy Fisher in loving memory of her brother, Ken Trumper. Serving on the staff of Peace Lutheran Church is the Reverend Dr. John Ferguson, Senior Pastor, the Reverend Robert Brown, Associate Pastor, and the Reverend Dr. Dennis Castens, Pastor Emeritus. We also have a Director of Music Ministry, Burnell Hackman who directs the chancel choir, peace orchestra, brass choir, and various handbell, instrumental, and children's choirs. Our director of Christian education is Christina Stackel, who oversees the ministry to junior and senior high youth. 
The director of early childhood education is Sue Velton, who with the full and part-time staff oversees our early childhood, daycare, and preschool programs. We will be presenting our 30th annual Living Last Supper worship service on Maundy Thursday, March 28th at 7 p.m. The setting is Leonardo da Vinci's famous painting as the actors portray how the disciples may have responded when Jesus said, one of you will betray me. The chancel choir adds to the worship service, service with various musical selections and the sol service culminates in the celebration of Holy Communion. Peace Lutheran Church owns and operates St. Trinity Cemetery, a non-sectarian endowed care cemetery at 2160 Lime Ferry Road. For more information about the cemetery, please call 314-892-3662. This now concludes the March 24th worship service at Peace Lutheran Church. We hope that you've enjoyed the worship service and will join us again next weekend. On behalf of audio engineer Dennis Gerfin, video engineer Mike Wilkie, the pastors, staff, and members of Peace, I'm Jeanette Mattingly. We wish you God's peace and the blessings of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ.